I, I don't know how many people know much about what Picture House has done generally. Is it worth me just flicking through a little presentation that we did in Rotterdam that showed some of the, um, the work that we've been doing across our 20 cinemas? Um, it is a, a, I've, I've stolen the presentation quickly from my person who does al alternative content, as we call it, out of uh, cinemas, which is, uh, is, is mainly the area that, uh, that we've been driving forward. It's been alternative content as well as film-related content. Um, but it does give you a, a, an idea of some of the work. And then I'll, I'll take you through sort of why we started to do it in 2004 and what the opportunities were as we saw them. But we've been developing it completely commercially uh, across that period um, and have found it actually very rewarding. Um, oh, where are we? We've gone straight to the end. There we go. That's not good. No, you don't need it now. <laughs> so to start with, uh, we've been going about 20 years as an organisation, been slowly adding cinemas year by year, and the whole ethos of what we do is about being more than simply film. It is about being a good architectural buildings, interesting architectural buildings, rescuing old cinemas uh, that were in trouble, um, providing bars, the sort of places where you would want to um, uh, hang out for a long time, talk about film, generally talk about the arts. And we, we have had that um, cultured audience generally uh, across the cinemas. Across the years, some of the uh, places that we've developed in the past, when there was capital finance available from the likes of the Arts Council, they were partnered, so we do do public-private partnership where we're the commercial uh, side of that. So I would say that the Arts Council <coughs> in one manifestation has been very important to the development of our, of our company, but that stopped quite a long time ago, really. Um, I'd say three or four years since one has been able to properly access um, uh, money from the Arts Council. But of course then, when the Film Council came on, decided no more... Uh, investment in the capital of cinemas, but that they would invest in the digital infrastructure of, of film and cinema, that was another fantastic catalyst. So when they decided to put uh, free digital projectors in uh, cinemas that, that, that um, applied for that across the country, we were lucky enough to get 17 of those projectors. Uh, I came from a place where the thing I find exciting about creating cinemas is creating great spaces where people want to watch a story in a darkened room. So I was just, excited, just as excited by the possibilities that the digital equipment gave to us as by the fact that it was about delivery of film. Uh, suddenly it was like all the new toys in the, in the toy box, to be honest. And it was, gosh, what, what will this enable us to do? Just, just how possible is it? Um, to change the whole face of what we do within the cinemas. Um, oops, a sheet. There we go. Page down. No, we're not going to be able to do anything. Like, well, uh, it's going to keep doing this to me, isn't it? See, I'm so techy. <laughs> <laughs> Just click on. There we go. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Alternative content. What? Why? When? Um, well, as I say, the 2004 really which was um, just after we had put in the kit from the Film Council. Um, and uh, it was explained to me that by uh, putting up a domestic satellite dish on our roofs and putting, and putting that dish across the roofs of as many places as we wanted to network, we could uh, beam in a signal, download that, and then push that through our DCI-compliant digital projectors. Uh, DCI, is everybody familiar with what that means? The Digital Cinema Initiative, which came out of Hollywood, essentially, which is about what high-end digital equipment in cinemas has to be in order to show first-run film. So we, we had the possibility of putting uh, domestic satellite dishes on roofs, bringing in these signals, experimenting with how that could then go through our DCI uh, equipment. Um, and... It was amazing. We did a Q&A with M. Nice Shyamalan mm -hmm. um, around the village. Um, and it was all very experimental. We, we, we'd put about 
six satellite dishes on the roofs of, of about six of our cinemas to see whether it worked. And I beetled up to York to watch it in York, and there was someone in the Ritzy filming it, and all oh, very exciting in 2004. Um, and um, I think for us, that was the start of realising how great it would be to have regular director Q&As, talk about films, show the, uh, show the films um, ahead or behind, and then have real live Q&As. What we haven't yet fully cracked is the kind of Q&As where the cinemas truly talk live to the filming cinema, the place where we're doing the event, either the Ritzy in Brixton or the Gate, or if the filmmaker's in Oxford, we might do it from Oxford. Um, we'll, we'll, t we'll take the cameras around and we'll produce the event and then beam it out through our group and to a whole load of other cinemas. We are we're doing Q&As, we're doing them by tweeting, and um, uh, so the questions come in through, through Twitter. Twitter feeds. Um, and, but it's a little bit ad hoc, really, isn't it? It's a little bit it? clunky still, yeah. It still means that we need to have a member of staff sat at the side of the stage reading Twitter and reading Facebook as they come in. But it still gives very much the feel of interaction, no matter what cinema in the UK you're watching it from. Uh, because, obviously... They read out the question. We always ask them to hashtag which cinema they're in. So again, it's it's very much a two-way thing. But it's it'd be great if we could make it a lot more streamlined. And as if you have a really good presenter within your cinema. I mean, we did the Man Booker Prize recently. I don't know if anybody would have seen that. So we did Man Booker live. So that was coming out of the festival hall. I think it was um, oh, Michael Nochte. Oh no, what's it? I can't remember his name. That's terrible, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Um But he was a great uh, um, person looking after it because you know, every time a question came in through the piece of paper, Twitter material that he had on a bit of paper. He was saying, all oh, right, and this is coming from Norwich, or this is coming from Bury St. Edmunds, this is coming from Cambridge. All very immediate. But we've still got that slight dysfunction in how we're actually dealing with the questions. I am sure there is technology out there. We are exploring it through various uh, um, uh, people who are involved in conferencing. That's quite an interesting area where there is conferencing technology all very expensive still, that does allow you to, to, to hook up those sorts of um, uh, more sophisticated uh, ways of, of talking across multi-platforms. Um, why? Uh, we thought we would find daytime and other audiences. Um, for cinema, the holy grail is to try to fill the cinemas during the day and to fill them on weekday evenings. Most cinemas in the UK will work to a capacity of about 25% or even less. Um, so what did we do? We partnered up with the Metropolitan Opera to show it on Saturday nights. Um, the Metropolitan Opera, uh, because there's, there's a real um, tradition of opera in, in America and through radio on Saturday afternoons, their whole series uh, goes through Saturday evenings. And it's between 9 and 12 um, uh, large productions a year um, and they drive through always on Saturday nights so we had to do quite a brave thing and decide that we would fight the film distributors and take off the main evening screening on a Saturday night uh, that is no easy thing to do when you're dealing with Hollywood majors who are the core of your product and your film's going through even if you're an independent um, the, the actual sort of cross-subsidy of what comes out of the majors, uh, which allows you to show the, 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 the more difficult material or the, uh, the, the, the more interesting material very often, um, it, it actually means there's a constant process of, of um, contracts and uh, fighting not to have 27, 28 screenings um, a week through your, through your cinemas. So we're now in the seventh season of The Met. Uh, over a quarter of a million admissions. I mean, the, the, the Metropolitan Opera's reach across the world through this methodology has, has been amazing. Um, the, the, the number of territories they've gone into and the, the reach that they've managed for their brand, that horrible uh, word, but they have certainly cast their footprint across the world, done it very, very successfully. Um, we were very proud to be um, really the... The, the first partner for the independence for NT Live, again, we did that on an experimental basis. Um, they entered into direct relationships with the three major um, uh, multiplexes, which is View, Odeon, and Cineworld. So they 
um, they sell their material into those three multiplex um, units themselves. But we organise and sell and network to um, all the well, hundreds now mm. of other cinemas across the UK that are showing this sort of material. Um, and NT Live very consciously went into a Thursday night um, in order to both tick the boxes for cinema as well as that amazing outreach that it does for their work. You know, how marvellous to be able to see what's going on on the South Bank but not actually have to schlep up to London or whatever. And, and it, it just creates enormous access. <coughs> the kind of cross-arts access this gives is, it, it is tremendous. In that context, I suppose I've been quite surprised that there hasn't been more material come out of uh, other places. I've expected to be bombarded with, with production companies wanting to do this, that and the other. But quite often it's been us saying to, to a, a, like with Leonardo Live, when the uh, Leonardo da Vinci um, uh, thing was going on, that was um, Phil um, Grabner, is it? Mm -hmm. No, Phil, not Grabner, Phil, <gasps> yes, down, a pr producer down here, getting old, can't remember these names. Um, but uh, he, um, he was the producer of that. He was one of the few producers who actually did sort of marry us together with um, uh, an arts organisation where we said, yes, this is going to be huge. We understand this exhibition is not going to be able to be seen by people right across the country. Not everybody wants to come into London. Not everybody can bear stand in those queues. This could be really exciting, even though it's actually, you know, absolutely static visual art. Um, now, mistake, not mistake, I don't know, we're all experimenting. We decided to try to enliven it, that we would do the opening party. Um, and we were doing it in, in partnership with Sky Arts as well. So um, to some people, that, uh, that reduced the level of the work a little bit because actually they would have enjoyed a more serious take on that particular um, exhibition. But we're all experimenting, we're learning, we're trying to um, take it on to the next, next level. Um, we're also the distributor for the uh, Bolshoi um, ballet. Um, dance has a slightly, it's a, a, a slightly uh, narrower audience. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough constituency to reach, um, but then that's because it's not our constituency, if you like. We're building those, those sorts of um, marketing relationships, those relationships with audiences in a very granular way. Um, and I'd like to get uh, braver and go into contemporary dance as well. Um, and we, we've talked to various contemporary dance um, uh, organisations, but at the moment it's quite tough even to get strong audiences for the absolute mainstream from Bolshoi or Royal Opera House. Um, and, and so that's an audience we need to build perhaps for another two or three years. Then we can branch out and um, ballet boys or Rombert or whatever. You know, here we come. Um, this is just a, a bit of a list of some of the Q&As that, that we've done. I mean, uh, we're probably doing one, maybe two a month now. Yeah, we've had everyone from Tarantino to um, Mike, Mike Lee. Lee to, well, so it's a huge list. This is actually an, an old list, but people, it, it's such an, it's a, a straightforward way, really, of people to market their film and for an audience to interact with them and uh, with, the, with the filmmaker. Um, um, this is not so relevant, I suspect, for, um, uh, for, for, for this audience. But for us, just to reinforce, the whole excitement of this was about live. Um, we are doing recorded encore um, events now, but for us it was all about live. And for us, one, once we can get to a, a digital network of cinemas streaming material live, that's the end game. That is still quite a long way away, I think, and, um, well, quite a long way away in, in technical uh, parlance, it might be a year away, but um, because it, where we are doing some of the more adventurous things, where we are truly streaming in the sense that you're probably um, uh, thinking about it today, we're actually finding it quite technically difficult. Yeah, I think uh, we've played around with lots of different ideas, we've used very much sort of home-based uh, web access through Skype, uh, we tried doing that for live Q&As, we found that obviously again, reliance on broadband uh, is never really that great to do a Q&A with. We've had some success with it, um, and as I say, the interaction that it gives you is great, 
Uh, something that we did recently that we found works very well was we did a, a live event with LCD Sound System. And that was uh, a film of their live concert that they did. And then we had one of the band members at one of our sites. And then the rest of the bandmates were in New York. And we actually used Google and we used their networking conference call system. Um, and it worked fantastically well. I mean, we found it to be a lot more stable. Um, and it gave the opportunity for us to have multiple users on the screen at the same time, which again created more of a conversation rather than just a one-way conversation with someone talking there and having questions read out. They could actually have a conversation between themselves on screen. Um, and we found that, that that actually gave us more of an event to publicise. Uh, we did that at 18 of our cinemas across our circuit, but then went out nationwide to many of the majors as well. And it was a phenomenal success. It was uh, a lot, most sites reported sellout screenings they did, if not up from 80% higher. And the feedback that they gave was they actually felt that they were part of an experience, which is, I think, something that Lynn always touches on. Having that live element means that you feel engaged. We've tried lots of other concerts that we've done recorded. We recently did the Coldplay concert where they recorded it live um, and then we showed it two months after the event and it didn't work. Mm. Very low attendances. Mm. And we feel that it's very much, even though Coldplay are presumed to be the biggest band in the world. So we're one of the few venues that can say we didn't sell out Coldplay. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly. Sad, really, but it's but, like, at the same time, the feedback was they wanted to feel part of the concert. Um, and, and that's the problem that we're finding. We're finding if we can do, uh, get involved with a live act happening there and then, public interest is there straight away. I think if they've seen clips of something that's recorded or they know a DVD's coming out of it later on, not so interested. Um, so, and that's where yeah, the opportunity lies, and it's as wide as your imagination, mm. really, because I don't think we've even touched the surface of what we could do on education projects, lifelong learning <coughs> projects, uh, teaching of medicine, um, uh, open university. Th there's, a, there's a mass of material out there that would attract audiences in, in specialised venues around yeah. the country if, if producers will... We'll grab hold of that and, um, and and bring it forward. I think there's even one of the things we're looking at at the moment is doing a, a cooking yeah. cooking program, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. where people come in and they can follow a, a chef on screen and then take home all the produce and then cook it at home as well. But you know, so there is a whole wide range of different yeah. material that you can do out there um, as long as the technology sort of keeps up. One of the other things that we're looking at doing is, is using. Um, a broadband network to get out alternative content to our sites. Um, and we're at the sort of test stage of it at the moment, and it's more about reliability of delivery to it. There might be people in this room who know more about it than we do. We're still experimenting, really, on how to, um, well, br bring in what we're calling skinny DCPs mm. into uh, the site and then we're sort of merging them through our DCI-compliant projector. And we're very worried about DCI-compliance. Um, because uh, the economics of our business and the cinema business still does depend on the studios. Mm, it's very much around encryption and security and obviously the delivery method that is preferred at the moment is obviously a courier bringing a hard drive along um, or satellites. Which amazingly are delivered in film boxes that are about <laughs> the same size as the old film boxes were. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so anyone, much for the digital age. Yeah, so if anyone is out there who has an idea about encryption and, and keeping things secure via broadband and doing it live at the simultaneous, you know, we're open to hear from anyone. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of people who are trying to do it on quite a domestic basis at the moment, realising what is possible, but, but actually, um, technically, it falls over quite often. Uh, whereas the satellite, uh, and we're still using those domestic satellite dishes, they do not fall over. Uh, it's extraordinary. Um, yes, there are also, there's also networks now through the multiplexes of 
high-end commercial, very sophisticated satellite dishes, which are a lot larger and a lot uglier on the top of ugly multiplexes. Um, uh, but um, they, you know, it's not technically necessary uh, to use those. And most of the arts organisations are still pushing their material out through the 1002 satellite, which can go to a domestic one. Um, I don't think you need to know those things. I'm sure you're all experts in your own audiences. Future trends. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a little bit of some arts saturation. I'm not sure that I want to hear from every last opera company in the world. Um, for me, one or two opera companies <coughs> have stamped their footprint and done it very effectively. Um, what's quite interesting is the world going in full circle at the moment. People are looking at their film libraries and thinking about how they can make events around um, dig digitised films. And there's some, there's some quite left of field things coming up which are exciting um, uh, and we're experimenting with. Sport is not so much our bag just because we've, we tend to be, um, well, Picture House is, uh, is more on the cultural end of things, I suppose, but we, we've experimented a little bit on mm. that. Um, and then music DVD promotions, book launches. Um, we are going to be launching a, a book club next year. It's going to be all about um, seeing um, authors as they are doing their new book, and they'll talk to an audience in cinemas about their, um, uh, about their book that might be launched that month. Um, will it work? I don't know. We'll try. Um, that's about it for me. Um, very, I, I'm most happy, really, if, if there's any questions, we'd sort of like to chat to you and engage with you, really, to understand if there's anything where, where there's ideas out there or where ideas we might have might be a catalyst to, to producers doing things as well. On a feeling, on a bound. Okay. <laughs> no, actually, I, I, was, I was thinking when you were speaking about um, this increasing overlap, actually, in, in the roles of cinema networks like you and what we used to think of broadcasters' jobs. And I think it's what's really interesting and exciting about a lot of the work that picture houses are doing, and particularly the work that you're thinking about piloting, mm -hmm. cooking shows, more interactive kind of productions. This is exactly the kind of thing that we would have expected our colleagues in Channel 4 particularly um, and BBC to be pioneering. And it's really interesting that it's coming from, from your end. Mm. And it's also really striking that you're saying that, that you feel that, you know, kind of like you're almost leaping ahead of where the producers are at and yeah. you're kind of wanting yeah. to be... Give us the material, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's really interesting, actually, because as broadcasting, particularly public service broadcasting, is almost sort of pulling back from some of the experimental work that we started to see, let's say, 10 years ago. There's a real potential gap in the market, I think, for... Well, it's funny, isn't it, that some of the guerrilla work is actually coming out of the traditional cinemas. Yeah. We've got three yeah. of the oldest cinemas in the country doing this. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, really, yeah. I just find that quite inspiring. What? I a question, really. <laughs> um, what's the quality like? Do you, I mean, do you use proper cameras? When we're streaming, well, well with the Q&A materials. Yeah. Yeah. Like a Q&A, for example. Yeah. How is that kind of... Depends on how much we spend each yeah, time. Yeah, the production quality. Yeah. Um, if you're talking the Metropolitan Opera, 17 HD cameras, 5.1 five, five, five surround sound. Um, but it, if you're talking a Q&A with Tarantino... We did three, one, three camera angles. Okay. Three camera angles, one left, one right, one from centre. And what you see on the screen, mm -hmm. what's the quality like? Fantastic. It, it's broadcast quality. Um, we use a satellite broadcast truck outside um, to up. Yeah, it's, it's all done via satellite. So they come in. We we sometimes work with different people. We have a very good relationship with an ITV production company. Um, they come in, bring in the, the satellite truck, set up outside the cinema, run all the cabling in, sound it all up, and it is this broadcast quality. Um, so again, it, for um, our point of view, it needs to be because then it's coming via satellite through our DCI compliant mm -hmm. kit. So again, when we're, we're using that kit, we can say we're maintaining the quality of DCI, mm -hmm. which is very important. It's very exciting to uh, watch it happening in the OB track as well, you know, all the live editing yeah. and all of that stuff. It's another world. It's, it's great. Mm. Okay. Do those DCI restrictions still apply when you're streaming live events? 
well, like non-cinema, you know, like theatre or ballet. Well, How this, this, this is this is the grey area because. DCI is not just a couple of pages, it's a great big wad of rules and regulations that you sign up to and there's big economics involved in it all as well um, because the studios are feeding back finance to the digital rollout across the UK. I don't know how much people are aware of that but they've been behind a lot of the funding of the UK going completely digital. Um, and so it's a very big work book um, and obviously piracy is our, our biggest threat at the moment and so people are very wary about doing anything that prejudices um, the, or, or somehow it could, could be vulnerable to attack, let's say, uh, of, of those machines. Um, so, uh, yes, they're being used for alternative content. Is it strictly uh, okay and safe? It's a grey area. Necessary, like if you just used a different projector when you were, you know, doing a simulcast of your own production. So it's Tarantino, you know, you're producing it, it's your show, he's not showing any clips of his work, it's just yeah. him and you, technically you don't need to DCI. No, that, right? it's just, it w means having multiple Projectors. projection yeah. kit yeah. and yeah. even the low end ones yeah. are quite expensive. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Uh, all of that stuff, but no, we could be showing it through, through um, HD yeah. projectors. But then, I think people expect a certain level of quality if they're in a cinema watching it. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's the other sort of downfall if you decide to put a smaller range projector in, and they're sat in the cinema and you're charging a premium rate ticket for it, mm -hmm. it off balances. So yeah. Oh, it's covered. Excellent. That's good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers.